and we're live. Hello, how are you? My name is Susan Marvin, and I'm the Chief of Alternative Dispute Resolution for the Florida Supreme Court, Office of the State Courts Administrator. And with me today is Kimberly Kosh, Senior Court Operations Consultant for the Dispute Resolution Center. And we're happy to be with you today to talk to you about Mediation Confidentiality 101. So we hope you learn a lot and you also enjoy yourselves. If you are having any technology issues, you may want to use Google Chrome as your browser. And you may also wanna try doing a refresh if you have any problems other than uh, using Google, Google Chrome. This webinar is being recorded. The materials were sent to you via your ADR director in your circuit. If you did not receive them for any reason, please just send your name and email address to drcmail at flcourts.org and we will provide them to you. The materials contain the agenda, a certificate of attendance with CME continuing mediator education credits, and the Florida Bar CLE credits, and also some handouts, which we're going to be referring to today. The handouts include the confidentiality highlights, uh, certain portions of Chapter 44, Florida statutes pertaining to mediator and mediation confidentiality, summaries of mediator ethics advisory committee opinions regarding confidentiality, and also the Mediator's Almanac, which has portions of Chapter 44, the State Court Rules of Procedure pertaining to mediation, and Part 2, Standards of Professional Conduct for Mediators from the Rules for Certified and Court-Appointed Mediators. As you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box on your screen, which can be accessed from your screen menu. And then we're going to answer those questions at the conclusion of the webinar. So feel free to put your questions there and we will get to them. You will receive an email after the presentation with five uh, evaluation questions and the CLE number, and that will come to you after the webinar. So uh, Kimberly is going to kick us off by um, starting the program. Thank you, Kimberly. Yes, and thank you, Susan, for that nice introduction. And it's nice to be with you this afternoon for Mediation Confidentiality 101. Uh, we appreciate your consideration that we had to move this training to a different day. And for those of you um, who had to rearrange your schedules for that, we, we apologize for any inconvenience. So we're going to start today with uh, a kind of a general cursor overview of mediation in the state of Florida. And it is always my hope that you learn something at one of our trainings, but I do hope today to, that you find a lot of this as a refresher in the review um, and perhaps learning something new. But by the end of the day, if you say to yourself, wow, I knew all of this information, please give yourself a big uh, pat on the back. And I'd like to start out before we uh, talk about anything in substance is finding out a little bit more about you. So I'm gonna kick off this section before we talk about mediation, confidentiality and privilege with a poll. So if you wouldn't mind um, indulging me in answering our poll, the question is, were you certified as a mediator before 2004? So I'm launching that poll now. And if you wouldn't mind, um, we've got about 120 of you online today. Um, and the well, boy, the responses are coming in quite quickly, Susan. Um, so with most of you having voted, and I say most of you about 80%, we have about 25% of you that you were certified as a mediator prior to 2000. And four. So that is a that's a huge accomplishment. Kudos to you. That's uh, 16 years ago. So um, 
let me close that down. And the reason that I asked that question is because the current version of our mediation confidentiality and privilege statute was adopted in 2004. And I knew that there was probably going to be a good percentage of you and 25% of you that probably took mediation training before this statute was adopted. And you may very well have been trained under a different version of confidentiality. So um, although it's been 16 years since the statute, the revised statute was passed, sometimes old habits die hard. So we're going to look at particularly four areas of resource, um, Chapter 44, the Florida statutes, the rules for certified and court appointed mediators, and then the various rules of court procedure that discuss mechanics. And Susan is going to hone in on the mediator ethics advisory committee opinions in this area. So I'm gonna take a look at the first three and then Susan is gonna synthesize a great deal of history for you. So as I said, uh, our current version was adopted by 2000, in 2004. And unlike most of our other court rules, such as the rules for certified and court appointed mediators and the procedural rules with across the ju different jurisdictions of the court, statutes are adopted by the legislature. So if we ever wanted to change anything about chapter 44, there's um, the court would have to go through the same legislative process that any bill or statute has to do in order to become inactive. So this uh, statutes are generally things that um, don't change rapidly from year to year. Um, and we've had very little change in this initial statute that was adopted in 2004. So um, moving on, we have uh, six different areas of uh, chapter 44. Um, and for those of you who, who are in that 25% of the of individuals trained, excuse me, trained before 2004, you may remember that confidentiality during those early years was sometimes contained in two sentences. Uh, in latter years, we had up to eight sentences on confidentiality. And the whole act now is six pages long. So we saw a huge expansion in 2004 from the, the, the two sentence that was wholly inadequate to describe confidentiality in the state to now six pages worth of information over um, six different areas. So we're going to look specifically at some definitions and the confidentiality exceptions and uh, what privilege means and how that interplays. So one of the things that's critically important when you think about mediation communications and mediation confidentiality uh, for me is to know exactly what the definition of mediation communication entails. Um, if you've been at some of my other trainings and I imagine that some of you had, you have probably heard me say that not everything, not every verbal word that is said when two people walk into a mediation room is a mediation communication. So a mediation communication, I know that you can read the screen in front of you, is defined and specifically has a purpose that it is made during the course of the mediation or made prior to the mediation if in furtherance of the mediation. So um, it's not just anything that you can talk about. If you were talking about the weather with a colleague and then walked into a mediation room, you would probably find that that conversation isn't a mediation communication. And that's just a very simple answer. Now, although many of us probably have heard mediation confidentiality described as what's said in this room stays in that room, I know that many of you know that that is no longer an accurate description of confidentiality, privilege, and the exceptions that are found in statute. And as a matter of fact, we find the first exemption, exception to confidentiality not in the exceptions area, but actually in the definition. The last sentence of the definitions that you'll see says the commission of a crime during a mediation is not a mediation communication. And there's part of me tongue in cheek that finds it amazing that we have to say that, but 
Um, back in the days when we had two sentences on confidentiality, there were many things that people claimed were confidential that uh, perhaps on its face would appear um, that it, it would not be confidential. So um, within the definitions, that's section 403, we're gonna move on to section 405, confidentiality, privilege, and exceptions. And um, just a, a note here that in the definitions in section 403, confidentiality itself is not defined. And we actually see a definition for confidentiality in the second sentence in section 405. And that is that a mediation participant shall not disclose a mediation communication to another person other than another mediation participant or a participant's counsel. So that's actually our definition or a good definition for confidentiality, although it doesn't say this is the definition. And preceding that statement says, except as provided, otherwise provided in this section, all mediation communications shall be confidential. So you start out with that mandatory, they shall be confidential. But then you'll notice that past confidentiality in the heading of 405, we have the words privilege and exceptions. So let's look at those. And privilege is the concept that any party can prevent another person from testifying or pre preventing that person from testifying in a subsequent proceeding. So confidentiality and privilege are two separate things. Confidentiality is maintaining the information only to those who are permitted and allowed to hear it. Confidentiality means the ability of a party to actually prevent another person from disclosing confidential communications. So um, if you have heard about mediation, confidentiality and privilege, it is not the same thing, two separate concepts. And um, privilege belongs only to the parties. If you have looked at other states or perhaps you've mediated elsewhere, sometimes there is a privilege for the mediator. And some states have it where um, the comments of the mediator cannot be disclosed uh, or the mediator can prevent one of the parties from disclosing comments the mediator made. Here in Florida, we don't have a mediator privilege. So if two parties um, voluntarily agree and no one asserts their privilege to stop the other person, communications made during mediation can be used in subsequent proceedings. But you're all experienced mediators and uh, for most part, you would know that um, if people are moving on to trial, one person is typically not going to give their permission for everything that's discussed at mediation to be used in a subsequent proceeding. So two different concepts, but um, very important. Um, the next thing the, stat the statute does is it establishes the exceptions to confidentiality. So again, going back to the comment about everything that is said in mediation stays in mediation. If you are yourself still using that comment during your opening statement, I would encourage you to change that and modify it so that there is the recognition that there are exceptions to confidentiality. And the statute specifically has six numerated out. However, um, right in the pre prelog to those six areas, um, the section starts out that there is no confidentiality or privilege attached to a signed written agreement reached during mediation unless the parties agree otherwise. So there are cases, um, I would imagine more in the circuit arena than in the court ordered context you might be mediating in, that the parties agree that the settlement document will be confidential. Um, and the rules of civil procedure in the circuit area um, actually contemplate that agreements might be confidential. And when you report the outcomes of those mediations, only the report of the mediation is required to be submitted. Um, it's not a requirement that the agreement be submitted to the court. And I'm talking by the mediator. 
So if we look at the exceptions, the first exception that we have is to which confidentiality or privilege against disclosure, disclosure has been waived by all of the parties. So Florida has a long history of self-determination, and we see a lot of ability for the uh, parties to self-determine throughout our rules. There are many areas where we see uh, statements beginning with unless the parties agree otherwise or unless the parties stipulate to. So um, it is possible that two people could agree to, and I'll go back to a common um, analogy that I use, we, two parties could agree to go on uh, a late night TV show and tell the host, the moderator, everything that happened at mediation. And if they wanted to bring the mediator along and the mediator wanted to go, the mediator is relieved of his or her confidentiality and ethics if the parties so disclose. So, uh, and if the parties allow you to make those comments. So um, nothing is uh, as probably as confidential as uh, one might think. So two, the second exception that we see are for communications. And again, these are for mediation communications that is willfully used to plan a crime, commit or attempt to commit a crime, conceal ongoing criminal activity or threaten violence. So this really expounds upon uh, the first exception that we saw in section 403, which said that the commission of a crime is not a mediation communication. So, um, uh, number three, the third exception, and if you were at the DRC's annual conference this year and you attended our ethics plenary, we had uh, a whole focus on um, elder uh, abuse and mandatory reporting. So we did a lot of education around chapter 39 or chapter 415. And these areas of mandatory report are your only mandatory reports. These are the only two areas where you as a mediator have no other option but to make a mandatory report. And for the purposes of confidentiality, you have confidenti exception from confidentiality solely for making the purpose of the report to the entity requiring the report. So this uh, exception does not give you great latitude in who you share the information with. So I know that um, perhaps if you are um, under the supervision of someone at the court or you would normally report certain things as an outcome of uh, mediation to your supervisor, you need to be very careful in this area, again, because the statute does restrict who the comments uh, should be made to. Um, and just as a reminder, chapter 39 deals with um, child abuse and neglect, and chapter 415 deals with vulnerable adult abuse. So again, your mandatory reports. Um, area number four and number six on the, the next slide are very much similar. Um, number four is communications that are offered to a report, prove or disprove professional malpractice during the mediation are, there's an exception for those, again, solely for the purpose of the professional malpractice proceeding. So if someone brought um, their financial planner to the, a mediation with um, him and the, the financial planner gave um, bad information or at least what the, the client thought was bad information and sues the financial planner for some type of malpractice, that investigatory board um, could be privileged to the communications that occurred um, without, without violating uh, the statute. So um, let me jump down to six, because like I said, six is very similar to number four. And six is offered to report, prove, or disprove professional misconduct occurring during the mediation solely for the internal use of the body conducting the investigation. And uh, professional mal uh, misconduct um, could be um, levied against any professional, um, typically, um, we may hear about uh, misconduct from other providers such as legal providers or financial uh, resources. Um, and this also allows the Florida Supreme Court's mediation qualifications 
um, disciplinary and review board, the MQDRB, through, which is staffed through our office, to look at the conduct of um, grievances against mediators when they come in. And this is the provision which allows members of staff in the hearing panel and others involved in investigating those complaints um, without fear of, again, violating the statute. So um, number five is, um, is, a, is a, a for, it, let's just put it this way, it's for judges to make determinations about whether or not communications meet this legally established grounds for voiding or reforming a settlement agreement reached during mediation. So one of the legally recognized reasons why someone or a judge may set aside an agreement could be um, coercion or um, impairment or um, some of those other things that are recognized um, in law. And it would be up to um, a judge to make that decision. So those are the six items in statute that uh, clearly are exceptions. And then, like I said, we have the one that's not enumerated where uh, a signed agreement, unless the parties agree otherwise, is also confidential. So we have confidentiality references in our rules for certified and court appointed mediators. And I know many times when people are looking for references to items that the rules, these rules are probably the first that you go to uh, rather than going to the statute or rules of procedure. But all of, those, all of those resources, in addition to the MEAC opinions that Susan will talk about, really form the, uh, the, the scope that confidentiality has to uh, be looked through. Um, looking at just the statute won't give you all of the obligations of the mediator. And looking at our rules for certified and court-appointed mediators isn't going to give you all of the parameters and the definitions that you would need to know to understand confidentiality and privilege. But so um, and the handouts that you have um, also contain a mediator's almanac, which has uh, references to chapter 44, part two of the rules and uh, most of the popular rules of procedure. So if you're able to, um, in, you know, after today's over, separate that out from your handouts and put that in your mediator toolbox, I think it would be a handy resource for you um, to keep. So in, in our rules for certified and court appointed mediators, we find that uh, our first rule is in rule uh, 10.630. And that is what requires mediators to keep all information confidential, except where disclosure is required or permitted by law or is agreed to by all the parties. So back to my late night TV show example, um, this is the rule that allows you, if all of the parties agree, to talk about information which they no longer deem confidential. I'm not suggesting that is your new policy. I'm just suggesting that that's what, um, that you have a little bit of, of self-determination there. Um, confidentiality is also mentioned in caucus and there are two layers of confidentiality in mediation. You have the confidentiality that belongs to all of the session and then you have confidentiality for caucus. And you'll see that that rule says that information obtained during caucus may not be revealed by the mediator to any other mediation participant without the consent of the disclosing party. So I imagine that most of you are very familiar with that rule and it kind of speaks for itself. Um, we also have confidentiality mentioned in the record keeping. So you are required to, in your storage and how you maintain your records to maintain confidentiality. And in addition to that, not release any identifying information when materials are used for research, training, or statistical compilations. All right. We also have rule 10.420, conduct of mediation. And this is uh, what guides us on the minimum that our opening statement, and actually it's called an orientation session, 
shall conclude. And the last thing on that list is that communications made during the process are confidential, except where disclosure is required or permitted by law. So I would encourage you, if you are not saying that exact sentence, to adopt it. It's very clear, it's very concise, and it covers your ethical requirement. If you want to give examples of what might be um, required to be disclosed by law, there's nothing that prohibits that. Um, so you could also offer that as a, a way of explaining what that confidentiality uh, provision means. Uh, moving along to the rules of procedure, the rules of procedure, and this is, we're looking at the civil rule here, states that a mediator shall report the lack of an agreement to the court without conduct or recommendation. Um, you'll see when Susan starts talking about the MEAC opinions, we have had quite an uptick of questions um, to the MEAC dealing with different things contained in a mediator's report. So we just want to make sure um, that we highlight our ethical obligation. And, well, and while confidentiality is not mentioned in particular in these sections, um, there are confidentiality implications if you inform the court of things on this report that the rule does not uh, give you permission to do that. So we also see there's a similar and companion rule in the family rules of procedure that says the mediator shall not report to the court, the mediator shall report the lack of an agreement to the court without comment or recommendation. So we see that exact uh, language there. So um, before we go on to Susan's area, which is going to focus on the MEAC questions, I have another poll for you. So I'm going to ask for your indulgence and um, I'm going to launch the poll and ask you about if any something has happened to you during a mediation. So the question reads, during a mediation that you personally conducted, did one party directly accuse another party or participant of violating confidentiality, i.e. speaking to another person, posting communications on social media, or recording the session? Well, and we're hovering right about 80% of uh, just about 70 of you have voted and uh, we're changing, Susan, it's going down to, luckily 75% of you are saying no, that someone has not made that accusation in progress. And uh, the flip side, 26 of you have experienced that type of accusation. Um, and the reason that I asked that question in particular was that um, we, when we do training around the state, we usually hear at least one horror story of parties communicating on social media during a mediation and, um, and have a discussion with the mediator about the appropriateness not of, of that occurring. So, um, and as a primer to Susan's uh, session, I'm going to ask the, uh, the last of our polling questions. And that question is, have you ever sought guidance from a peer, a colleague, supervisor, or MEAC opinions on an issue involving mediation confidentiality? And I want to thank you for participating. The votes are coming in. We had almost 85% of you voting in the, in the last question. We're up to a little bit higher than 85% now. And Susan, more than 60% of our audience says that they have sought a resource and guidance from someone or a MEAC opinion um, based on confidentiality. And I would imagine that we are both thrilled to hear that there are other resources for you uh, in addition to the written literature um, that you can be availing yourself of. That is terrific. It's always good to hear that mediators are discussing things with their peers. Right. So I have wrapped up my session and my part, Susan, if you want to go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you. So um, 
I think I have control of the screen now. You should, the um, on the lower left hand side, the bottom, if you hover around, should have an advance and uh, arrow. If not, maybe your enter key will work. Okay. All right. Well, as you know, rule 10.910, uh, rules for certified and court appointed mediators, um, has the provisions about the Mediator Ethics Advisory Committee, or MEAC, as we're going to refer to them. And that's a nine member Florida Supreme Court appointed committee that issues written advisory opinions to mediators. Uh, it sounds like some of you may have asked for uh, MEAC opinions in the past. And in your handouts on page seven, we've given you a, sum a list of summaries of all the opinions from MEAC on the topic of confidentiality. So um, you can look at those on this particular uh, topic. And if you ever wanna look at more MEAC opinions for your peer discussions, um, go to our website, flcourts.org and go to the ADR uh, portion and find the MEAC opinions. There are indexes that also list uh, the MEAC opinions by um, type. Other, you know, if you want to look for some other than confidentiality, that's a great resource. So feel free to check that out. Um, Susan, you just went to mute. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't still don't have the ability to advance the slides. All right. Well, if you want to tell me, I'll go ahead and advance. Are you yeah. ready? Yes, please. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is the scope of confidentiality. And then in a few minutes, we're also gonna talk about reports to the court regarding agreements and appearance. And third, reports to the court regarding um, non-confidential information. So as we look at the, at the scope of confidentiality, I thought, well, let's just define what scope is. It is the extent or range of confidentiality during mediation. So um, Kimberly covered very thoroughly, um, you know, you don't want to say to the parties in your mediation orientation that everything they say in mediation is confidential because as she explained, that's simply not true. So, um, it, it, she gave you great advice about how to explain mediation confidentiality um, where you know it allows for disclosure that's required or permitted by law or agreed to by all parties. So our first uh, takeaway, if you wanna go to the next slide, Kimberly, um, we're gonna have three takeaways under scope. And uh, the first one is that not all oral or written communications during mediation are confidential mediation communications. As Kimberly pointed out to you, um, chapter 43 or 44, section 44.403, subsection one says, oral or written statements intended to make an assertion by or to a mediation participant made during a mediation or prior to mediation if made in furtherance of a mediation. So Kimberly gave you an example, you know, if, if about things said in mediation that aren't necessarily confidential. If I tell you I grew up in Michigan um, and it has nothing to do with the case, that's not confidential. By the same token, there may be some writings uh, that are exchanged in mediation that are confidential. Uh, we know that a signed agreement under the statute is uh, not confidential, but let's say um, that, uh, and I'm going to use an example from a MEAC opinion. In fact, it's MEAC opinion 2004-010. And that was a mediation regarding a claim against the state. If a public agency provides a plaintiff with a written apology during the course of a mediation, does that written apology fall within the definition of a mediation 
communication as defined by the statute? And would that be confidential if it does? The MEAC uh, believes that a written apology like the one described by the inquirer clearly fell within the definition of a mediation communication. And so it was not confidential. Since it wasn't included in the written agreement um, and mediation uh, confidentiality had not been waived by the parties, that written apology does not fall within any of the exceptions that are set forth in the statute that Kimberly just taught you about. So you can have writings and mediation that are confidential even if the uh, written and signed agreement is not. The second takeaway is about federal court rules. There may be some of you that practice mediation in federal court and the MEAC issued two opinions about federal court rules and confidentiality um, in the last, uh, two, the first ones in 2012, 2012-005, and then the second one is in 2014. So in 2012, the MEAC uh, received a question, two questions in one, one, by one inquirer. Uh, and the first question was, is it a breach of confidentiality for mediators to disclose that a party failed to negotiate in good faith or willfully failed to appear at a mediation conference when the disclosure is required by the local rules of Florida federal courts. So many of you practice mediation in the state courts, but this is federal court. And two, if, um, if so, then should the mediator withdraw from all mediations in federal courts that require such a disclosure? Um, so we're talking about local procedural rules in federal bankruptcy court in this particular question. And um, complying with local court rules falls under uh, rule for certified and court appointed mediators 10.360, which uh, creates the exception that we've been talking about. A mediator shall maintain confidentiality of all information revealed during mediation, except where disclosure is required or permitted by law or is agreed to by all parties. So um, the rule or law in federal court is that um, a mediator needs to report uh, whether a party negotiates in good faith or willfully fails to appear at a mediation. So that was one of the rules the MEAC considered. Uh, they also uh, discussed rule 10.520 in their opinion. And that rule is a mediator shall comply with all statutes, court rules, in this case, a federal court rule, local court rules and administrative orders relevant to the practice of mediation. So under that rule, um, if you're mediating in federal court you are required to comply with the federal court rules. The MEAC also looked at rule 10.500, which says a mediator is accountable to the referring court. And actually you could probably go to the next slide, uh, Kimberly. Okay. I'm, I'm just talking along here, but um, uh, the, the other rule 10.500, a mediator is accountable to the referring court with ultimate authority over the case. So any interaction discharging that responsibility needs to be conducted in a manner consistent with the mediator ethical rules, um, but you are accountable to the, to the referring court. So the MEAC said that the mediator may report to the federal court in which the mediator is conducting the mediation exactly what the mediator asked here, the willful failure to attend mediation or to participate in good faith. Uh, the MEAC thinks that the mediator should highlight during their orientation statement that the federal bankruptcy courts, uh, what, what the federal bankruptcy courts requirement is about uh, willful, fa willful failure to attend and good faith so that um, the parties can decide if they want to mediate under those conditions. 
Um, so that kind of got fleshed out in MEAC 2014-10. If, uh, and maybe I can, I think I can do it now, Kimberly. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, so no, I don't seem to there. If you'd go to 2014-10, yeah. thank you. Okay. Um, so in that one, the MEAC was asked to clarify 2012-005, and um, the clarification was that if the parties wish to proceed after being informed of the federal court requirement, um, then that's up to them and it does not violate mediator ethics. So uh, the third takeaway is going to the next slide. Parties can waive mediation uh, confidentiality for the entire mediation or for uh, discrete portions of the mediation or particular subject matters. So um, this one is MEAC 2004-10 um, and well, actually, I think we want to be in uh, 2019-001, uh, Kimberly. 2019-001? Yes. I don't think I included that one. Okay. Um, you're right. Well, I'm going <laughs> to tell you about that one. Just kidding. Uh, we'll just wake you up. Um, the, uh, this in 2019-001, uh, a question was asked by a full-time Florida Supreme Court, uh, by two full-time Florida Supreme Court certified mediators employed, employed by the Florida Commission on Human Relations about a requirement of their job, which was to report negotiations in a case management system accessible by all of the employees and HUD. Um, housing and Urban Development, that's a federal agency. So the question was, can we put confidential negotiation information in this case management system that our employer requires us to enter into that case management system? But um, there was no state or federal law that required these mediators to disclose the confidential information which were negotiations made during mediation. So the MEAC said, no, you cannot do that unless the parties waive confidentiality. So uh, that's why I'm talking about this. It goes to waiving confidentiality. Um, you can waive confidentiality and then uh, the mediator can disclose uh, information, but unless you do that or it fits under an exception, the mediator can't disclose it. And our next uh, grouping of MEAC opinions is reports to the court regarding agreements and appearance. Um, and the first takeaway, if you'd go to the next slide, Kimberly, um, is that there are four separate rules of procedure that include reports of mediation and um, those are not all identical. So, in state court, we have state court rules of procedure. And sometimes we mediators forget that those apply to us, but there are rules pertaining to mediation. And some of them have to do with agreements and appearance. Um, so we're going to look at MEAC 2017-006. Um, thank you. Uh, in this opinion, the MEAC was asked to revise a previous opinion that didn't allow for the report of partial agreements. Um, that was a problem for mediators because sometimes parties reach partial agreements and the mediators need to be able to report that. So in this opinion, 2017-006, MEAC retracted its 2014-002 opinion and any other opinions that were inconsistent and said you can report agreement, no agreement or partial agreement. Next slide. For the second takeaway, um, well, actually we need to go back one. 
They're often local court rules for reporting items such as attendance or non-appearance that are not contained in st state court rules. So you always want to find out if there's a local court rule or administrative order that pertains to what you can report. Um, and uh, they're basically in this opinion, which I will let you look at, um, the MEAC said there wasn't any rule that pertains or requires a mediator to report attendance at mediation or prohibits it. One of the parties had asked the mediator to report the non-attendance of the defendant. And um, the mediator was just asking, did the mediator have to report that non-attendance? And the MEAC said no unless the mediator is obligated to report it based on a local rule or administrative order, it's up to the mediator whether to report attendance or not. And uh, that's based on rule 10.520, which states that a mediator shall comply with all statutes, court rules, local rules, and administrative orders relevant to the practice of mediation. The third takeaway on reports is what Kimberly already taught you, um, if you want to go to the next slide, which is that reports should not, and one more, yeah, reports should not contain confidential information. Just don't put any confidential information in your reports unless the parties agree to it and sign off on it. Um, in MEAC 2013 001, um, the inquirer submitted several questions about unsigned agreements um, and uh, especially for parties that appear telephonically and they don't send back their signed agreement quickly. So the MEAC said it is a breach of confidentiality for a certified mediator to report to the court that a party who appears telephonically or by any other electronic means failed to return the signed agreement after verbally agreeing to sign it. Um, so because uh, if you don't return an agreement signed, um, saying anything about that agreement would be a, a, a confidential mediation communication. Um, and there were a couple more questions which I am going to let you read about so that we can move to the next section. Reports to the court regarding non-confidential -con information. The, the first takeaway on this section is that except for mandatory reports under chapter 39 and 4, 415 and allegations of mediator misconduct or professional malpractice, Chapter 44 does not specify what entity or person crimes should be reported to. So we know who to report them to. If they're a mandatory report, then you would call the hotlines. Um, but most of the other uh, exception reports that aren't mandatory, you know, who are you going to call to report them? So, um, that's an issue and that was addressed um has been mentioned in some of the MIAC opinions but uh MIAC has not specifically said well you report this crime to a law enforcement officer you report you report this other crime to the judge that um it it still is unspecified the second takeaway is that the reporting of crimes based on mediation communications other than mandatory reports is at the discretion of the mediator. Hence, they're not mandatory. There's only two types of mandatory reports, child and vulnerable adult abuse and neglect situations, 30, chapter 39 and 415. The rest of the reports are not mandatory um, or you know, exceptions to mediation confidentiality. So uh, the third takeaway is that if a mediator determines during mediation 
that they are going to report one or more of the parties, then they would be obligated to adjourn or terminate the mediation. And that's spoken of, um, several of these takeaways are spoken of in MEAC 2012-007. Um, and uh, so I am going to leave that to your uh, perusal to uh, gain more information on the topic of what non-confidential information you can report. You just want to be cautious about who you report it to and remember that you have discretion. Unless it's a mandatory report, you have discretion. So with that, Kimberly, I see that we do have some questions in the Q&A and I did not want to take up all the time. Okay. All right. Let me go ahead and uh, stop sharing our screen. There we go. And all right. So um, our, one of our first questions, is it up to the mediator to determine if the parties wish to keep the settlement from being made public? Susan, you want to take a stab at that one? Well, I think if the mediator has any inkling, of course, under the statute, the signed agreement is not confidential. So if someone raises it that they would like it to be confidential, um, then, you know, that's what the mediator needs to do. The mediator can't make any decisions. That would be the party's right of self-determination. So if the mediator has any questions about whether the parties uh, want it to be kept confidential, the mediator should ask. All right. Are you, how about a second one? Are you ready? I got another sure. one for you. Okay. <laughs> what should be added to our opening statement in lieu of stating what said in mediation stays in mediation? Well, you know, uh, my mediation trainers that I uh, used back in the day just said, repeat, repeat the phrase that's in rule 10.360. Everything you say in mediation is confidential except as, uh, as permitted, except where disclosure is permitted or required under the law. Just track that language and stop there. Okay. Good one. Um, so uh, we did have uh, another question. Here we go. For research and training, can issues arrive in a mediation be disclosed when there is no identifying information given and the facts are disguised? There is a MEAC opinion on that and you will find it, I believe, in the index of confidential MEAC opinions, the little summaries. And uh, yes, you can, if you're careful and you protect the confidential information, you can uh, use information for research. Okay, great. How, and you're doing so well. Do you mind me just pitching these to you? No, until, <laughs> until I fail to do well. <laughs> no, no. All right. Can you report that an agreement is a temporary agreement? Well, you know, going on what the MIAC opinions say, if the parties agree to you reporting that, then you can report it. So um, I would not want to put that in uh, a report or as a title of an agreement without a paragraph in the agreement that said, um, both parties hereby agree to the mediator reporting that this is a temporary agreement. Yes, thank you. And, and uh, that's exactly what the MEAC says on there, that the better practice is to report it in the, in the agreement and not the report. Although in family, um, you are allowed to make certain comments if the parties agree. All right, here's, you're, you're batting a thousand, Susan. So here, here's another one for you. Do you have to tell the parties why you are terminating? No. You do not have to tell them. And Kimberly artfully uh, composes ways to gracefully tell them that you are terminating without really revealing anything. So Kimberly, do you wanna repeat some of those phrases I've heard you mention? 
Um, I have told the parties before that we've come to a part where I don't think that I'm going to be able to assist them any further and in order to be respectful of their time and, um, you know, the, as well as the court's time, I would suggest that we move on uh, to the next step in the court process. So I tend to bring it back to myself. Um, I would feel very uncomfortable telling the parties why I was, quote, terminating the process, because the words terminate um, ring to me the, the, that you're terminating for an ethical purpose. I mean, because we are required to adjourn or terminate under Rule 10.420. So uh, perhaps you might be using that word more generally. But for me, when you say terminate, I, that rings ethical bells to me. And um, depending on why you are bringing an end to the session, it, you may inadvertently be communicating something to one party about the other party. If, um, if I was in a mediation and you told me that, hey, I'm terminating it, I, and I know mediator lingo, I know something has gone wrong. And if I'm sitting in one room and I don't think I'm the cause of it, I might be wondering what's going on. Um, in, in the other room. So especially if you have repeat parties or parties who are familiar with our ethical obligations and, and terminology. So um, I did, I'll, I'll volunteer to answer a question, Susan. We did, have, um, we did have a question about whether or not the PowerPoint would be um, sent out. And um, it's not an, it will not automatically come to you, but if you want to email the DRC mail at flcourts.org or you want to email me, my email was in the confirmation email you received today, we would be happy uh, to share that with you. Um, and um, with the four minutes we have left, Susan, can we kind of come to a close with some of the, the post information that's going to, or the post um, training that's stuff that's going on? The evaluation coming to everyone by email. Yes. <laughs> we would appreciate, and, and it helps us craft uh, more effective presentations for you if you uh, fill out an evaluation and it will be coming to you by email with only five questions. Only five questions. So you'll receive that sometime tomorrow. And like Susan said, if you could fill it out, that would be wonderful. Um, Susan said at the beginning of the presentation that this um, program has been approved for one uh, uh, hour of CLE credit and the Florida bar approval number is on the first page of the handout. You will also see on our handouts that we have a series of these one hour ethical uh, webinars planned over the next couple of months. So mark your calendars, your next, uh, the next date is Friday, February 13th. Um, and we're going to alternate between 3 p.m. and noontime offerings. And um, if you have a colleague that wasn't able to make it today, our goal is to place the recording of this webinar on the court's YouTube channel. Um, we hope to have that done in the next several weeks. And once that link is up and available, we will send it out to our ADR directors in the field. And we will also publish it in some other forum for the benefit of all certified mediators through our website or our uh, one of our newsletters. So um, with that, we hope you have a wonderful afternoon and we thank you for your time. And for those of you who celebrated Mediation Week last week, um, thank you for sending pictures and all those wonderful things about your celebration. Would you thank like you. to say any? Thanks, Susan. Yes. Have uh, it feels like Friday, but it's not. But have a great <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> all right, everyone. We'll catch you on Friday, February thirteenth, for our next round. Have a great afternoon. Yes. We appreciate your service to the court system.